Chapter Six, Part One of the Life of Cicero, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Life of Cicero, Volume One, by Anthony Trollope. Chapter Six, Veres, Part One. There are six episodes, or, as I may say, divisions, in the life of Cicero, to which special interest attaches itself. The first is the accusation against Verres, in which he drove the miscreant howling out of the city. The second is his consulship, in which he drove Catiline out of the city, and caused certain other conspirators who were joined with the arch-rebel to be killed, either legally or illegally. The third was his exile, in which he himself was driven out of Rome. The fourth was a driving out, too, though of a more honourable kind, when he was compelled, much against his will, to undertake the government of a province. The fifth was Caesar's passing of the Rubicon, the Battle of Pharsalia, and his subsequent adherence to Caesar. The last was his internecine combat with Antony, which produced the Philippics, and that memorable series of letters in which he strove to stir into flames the expiring embers of the Republic. The literary work with which we are acquainted is spread, but spread very unevenly, over his whole life. I have already told the story of Sextus Roscius Amerinus, having taken it from his own words. From that time onward he wrote continually, but the fervid stream of his eloquence came forth from him with unrivalled rapidity in the twenty last miserable months of his life. We have now come to the first of those episodes and I have to tell the way in which Cicero struggled with Verres, and how he conquered him. In 74 BC, Verres was praetor in Rome. At that period of the Republic there were eight praetors elected annually, two of whom remained in the city, whereas the others were employed abroad, generally with the armies of the empire. In the next year, 73 BC, Verres went in due course to Sicily, with proconsular or propraetorial authority, having the government assigned to him for twelve months. This was usual and constitutional, but it was not unusual, even if unconstitutional, that this period should be prolonged. In the case of Verres it was prolonged, so that he should hold the office for three years. He had gone through the other offices of the state, having been quaestor in Asia, and aedile afterward in Rome, to the great misfortune of all who were subjected to his handling, as we shall learn by and by. The facts are mentioned here to show that the great offices of the Republic were open to such a man as Verres. They were in fact more open to such a candidate than they would be to one less iniquitous, to an honest man or a scrupulous one, or to one partially honest or not altogether unscrupulous. If you send a dog into a wood to get truffles, you will endeavour to find one that will tear up as many truffles as possible. A proconsular robber did not rob only for himself, he robbed more or less for all Rome. Verres boasted that with his three years of rule he could bring enough home to bribe all the judges, secure all the best advocates, and live in splendid opulence for the rest of his life. What a dog he was to send into a wood for truffles! To such a condition as this had Rome fallen, when the deputies from Sicily came to complain of their late governor and to obtain the services of Cicero in seeking for whatever reparation might be possible. Verres had carried on his plunder during the years 73, 72, 71 B.C. During this time Cicero had been engaged sedulously as an advocate in Rome. We know the names of some of the cases in which he was engaged, those, for instance, for Publius Oppius, who, having been quaestor in Bithynia, was accused by his proconsul of having endeavoured to rob the soldiers of their dues. We are told that the poor province suffered greatly under these two officers, who were always quarrelling as to a division of their plunder. In this case the senior officer accused the younger, and the younger, by Cicero's aid, was acquitted. Quintilian more than once refers to the speech made for Oppius. Cicero also defended Varenus, who was charged with having murdered his brother, and one Caius Mustius, of whom we only know that he was a farmer of taxes. He was advocate also for Sthenius, a Sicilian who was accused before the tribunes by Verres. We shall hear of Sthenius again among the victims in Sicily. 
The special charge in this case was that, having been condemned by Verres as praetor in Sicily, he had run away to Rome, which was illegal. He was, however, acquitted. Of these speeches we have only some short fragments, which have been quoted by authors whose works have come down to us, such as Quintilian, by which we know, at any rate, that Cicero's writings had been so far carefully preserved, and that they were commonly read in those days. I will translate here the concluding words of a short paper written by M. de Rosoir, in reference to Cicero's life at this period. The assiduity of our orator at the bar had obtained for him a high degree of favour among the people, because they had seen how strictly he had observed that Cincian law which forbade advocates to take either money or presents for their pleadings, which law, however, the advocates of the day generally did not scruple to neglect. It is a good thing to be honest when honesty is in vogue, but to be honest when honesty is out of fashion is magnificent. In the affair with Verres, there are two matters to interest the reader, indeed to instruct the reader, if the story were sufficiently well told. The iniquity of Verres is the first, which is of so extravagant a nature as to become farcical by the absurdity of the extent to which he was not afraid to go in the furtherance of his avarice and lust. As the victims suffered two thousand years ago, we can allow ourselves to be amused by the inexhaustible fertility of the man's resources, and the singular iniquity of his schemes. Then we are brought face to face with the bare-faced corruption of the Roman judges, a corruption which, however, became a regular trade, if not ennobled, made at any rate aristocratic, by the birth, wealth, high names, and senatorial rank of the robbers. Sulla, for certain state purposes, which consisted in the maintenance of the oligarchy, had transferred the privileges of sitting on the judgment-seat from the equites, or knights, to the senators. From among the latter a considerable number, thirty perhaps, or forty, or even fifty, were appointed to sit with the praetor to hear criminal cases of importance, and by their votes, which were recorded on tablets, the accused person was acquitted or condemned. To be acquitted by the most profuse corruption entailed no disgrace on him who was tried, and often but little on the judges who tried him. In Cicero's time the practice, with all its chances, had come to be well understood. The provincial governors, with their quaestors and lieutenants, were chosen from the high aristocracy, which also supplied the judges. The judges themselves had been employed, or hoped to be employed, in similar lucrative service. The leading advocates belonged to the same class. If the proconsular thief, when he had made his bag, would divide the spoil with some semblance of equity among his brethren, nothing could be more convenient. The provinces were so large, and the Greek spirit of commercial enterprise which prevailed in them so lively, that there was room for plunder ample, at any rate, for a generation or two. The Republic boasted that in its love of pure justice it had provided by certain laws for the protection of its allied subjects against any possible faults of administration on the part of its own officers. If any injury were done to a province or a city, or even to an individual, the province or city or individual could bring its grievance to the ivory chair of the praetor in Rome, and demand redress. And there had been cases, not a few, in which a delinquent officer had been condemned to banishment. Much, indeed, was necessary before the scheme as it was found to exist by Verres could work itself into perfection. Verres felt that in his time everything had been done for security as well as splendour. He would have all the great officers of state on his side. The Sicilians, if he could manage the case as he thought it might be managed, would not have a leg to stand upon. There was many a trick within his power before they could succeed in making good even their standing before the praetor. It was in this condition of things that Cicero bethought himself that he might at one blow break through the corruption of the judgment-seat, and this he determined to do by subjecting the judges to the light of public opinion. If Verres could be tried under a bushel, as it were, in the dark, as many others had been tried, so that little or nothing should be said about the trial in the city at large, then there would be no danger for the judges. It could only be by shaming them, by making them understand that Rome would become too hot to hold them, 
that they could be brought to give a verdict against the accused. This it was that Cicero determined to effect, and did effect. And we see throughout the whole pleadings that he was concerned in the matter not only for the Sicilians or against Verres. Could something be done for the sake of Rome, for the sake of the Republic, to redeem the courts of justice from the obloquy which was attached to them? Might it be possible for a man so to address himself, not only to the judgment seat, but to all Rome, as to do away with this iniquity once and for ever? Could he so fill the minds of the citizens generally with horror at such proceedings, as to make them earnest in demanding reform? Hortensius, the great advocate of the day, was not only engaged on behalf of Verres, but he was already chosen as consul for the next year. Metellus, who was elected praetor for the next year, was hot in defence of Verres. Indeed, there were three Metelluses among the friends of the accused, who also had on his side the Scipio of the day. The aristocracy of Rome was altogether on the side of Verres, as was natural. But if Cicero might succeed at all in this which he meditated, the very greatness of his opponents would help him. When it was known that he was to be pitted against Hortensius as an advocate, and that he intended to defy Hortensius as the coming consul, then surely Rome would be awake to the occasion. And if Rome could be made to awake herself, then would this beautiful scheme of wealth from provincial plunder be brought to an end. I will first speak of the work of the judges, and of the attempts made to hinder Cicero in the business he had undertaken. Then I will endeavour to tell something of the story of Verres and his doings. The subject divides itself naturally in this way. There are extant seven so-called orations about Verres, of which the two first apply to the manner in which the case should be brought before the courts. These two were really spoken, and were so effective that Verres, or probably Hortensius on his behalf, was frightened into silence. Verres pleaded guilty, as we should say, which, in accordance with the usages of the court, he was enabled to do by retiring and going into voluntary banishment. This he did, sooner than stand his ground and listen to the narration of his iniquities, as it would be given by Cicero in the full speech, the perpetua oratio, which would follow the examination of the witnesses. What the orator said before the examination of the witnesses was very short. He had to husband his time, as it was a part of the grand scheme of Hortensius, to get adjournment after adjournment, because of certain sacred rites and games, during the celebration of which the courts could not sit. All this was arranged for in the scheme, but Cicero, in order that he might baffle the schemers, got through his preliminary work as quickly as possible saying all that he had to say about the manner of the trial, about the judges, about the scheme, but dilating very little on the iniquities of the criminal. But having thus succeeded, having gained his cause in a great measure by the unexpected quickness of his operations, then he told his story. Then was made that perpetua oratio, by which we have learned the extent to which a Roman governor could go on desolating a people who were entrusted to his protection. This full narration is divided into five parts, each devoted to a separate class of iniquity. These were never spoken, though they appear in the form of speeches. They would have been spoken, if required, in answer to the defence made by Hortensius on behalf of Verres after the hearing of the evidence. But the defence broke down altogether, in the fashion thus described by Cicero himself. In that one hour in which I spoke, this was the speech which we designate as the Actio Prima Contra Verem, the first pleading made against Verres, to which we shall come just now. I took away all hope of bribing the judges from the accused, from this brazen-faced, rich, dissolute, and abandoned man. On the first day of the trial, on the mere calling of the names of the witnesses, the people of Rome were able to perceive that if this criminal were absolved, then there could be no chance for the Republic. On the second day, his friends and advocates had not only lost all hope of gaining their cause, but all relish for going on with it. The third day so paralysed the man himself, that he had to bethink himself not what sort of reply he could make, but how he could escape the necessity of replying by pretending to be ill. It was in this way that the trial was brought to an end, 
But we must go back to the beginning. When an accusation was to be made against some great Roman of the day, on account of illegal public misdoings, as was to be made now against Verres, the conduct of the case, which would require probably great labour and expense, and would give scope for the display of oratorical excellence, was regarded as a task in which a young aspirant to public favour might obtain honour, and by which he might make himself known to the people. It had therefore come to pass that there might be two or more accusers anxious to undertake the work, and to show themselves off as solicitous on behalf of injured innocence, or desirous of labouring in the service of the Republic. When this was the case, a court of judges was called upon to decide whether this man or that other was most fit to perform the work in hand. Such a trial was called divinatio, because the judges had to get their lights in the matter as best they could, without the assistance of witnesses, by some process of divination, with the aid of the gods, as it might be. Cicero's first speech in the matter of Verres is called In Quintum Caecilium Divinatio, because one Caecilius came forward to take the case away from him. Here was a part of the scheme laid by Hortensius. To deal with Cicero in such a matter would no doubt be awkward. His purpose, his diligence, his skill, his eloquence, his honesty, were known. There must be a trial. So much was acknowledged, but if the conduct of it could be relegated to a man who was dishonest, or who had no skill, no fitness, no special desire for success, then a little scheme could be carried through in that way. So Caecilius was put forward as Cicero's competitor, and our first speech is that made by Cicero to prove his own superiority to that of his rival. Whether Caecilius was or was not hired to break down in his assumed duty as accuser, we do not know. The biographers have agreed to say that such was the case, grounding their assertion, no doubt, on extreme probability. But I doubt whether there is any evidence as to this. Cicero himself brings this accusation, but not in that direct manner which he would have used had he been able to prove it. The Sicilians, at any rate, said that it was so. As to the incompetency of the man, there was probably no doubt, and it might be quite as serviceable to have had an incompetent as a dishonest accuser. Caecilius himself had declared that no one could be so fit as himself for the work. He knew Sicily well, having been born there. He had been quaestor there with Verres, and had been able to watch the governor's doings. No doubt there was, or had been in more pious days, a feeling that a quaestor should never turn against the proconsul under whom he had served, and to whom he had held the position almost of a son. But there was less of that feeling now than heretofore. Verres had quarrelled with his quaestor. Oppius was called on to defend himself against the proconsul with whom he had served. No one could know the doings of the governor of a province as well as his own quaestor, and therefore, so said Caecilius, he would be the preferable accuser. As to his hatred of the man, there could be no doubt as to that. Everybody knew that they had quarrelled. The purpose, no doubt, was to give some colourable excuse to the judges for rescuing Verres, the great paymaster, from the fangs of Cicero. Cicero's speech on the occasion, which, as speeches went in those days, was very short, is a mozzel of sagacity and courage. He had to plead his own fitness, the unfitness of his adversary, and the wishes in the matter of the Sicilians. This had to be done with no halting phrases. It was not simply his object to convince a body of honest men that, with the view of getting at the truth, he would be the better advocate of the two. We may imagine that there was not a judge there, not a Roman present, who was not well aware of that before the orator began. It was needed that the absurdity of the comparison between them should be declared so loudly that the judges would not dare to betray the Sicilians, and to liberate the accused by choosing the incompetent man. When Cicero rose to speak, there was probably not one of them of his own party, not a consul, a praetor, an aedile, or a quaestor, not a judge, not a senator, not a hanger-on about the courts, but was anxious that Verres, with his plunder, should escape. Their hope of living upon the wealth of the provinces hung upon it. But if he could speak winged words, words that should fly all over Rome, that might fly also among subject nations, then would the judges not 
dare to carry out this portion of the scheme. When, he says, I had served as quaestor in Sicily, and had left the province after such a fashion that all the Sicilians had a grateful memory of my authority there, though they had older friends on whom they relied much, they felt that I might be a bulwark to them in their need. These Sicilians, harassed and robbed, have now come to me in public bodies, and have implored me to undertake their defence. The time has come, they say, not that I should look after the interest of this or that man, but that I should protect the very life and well-being of the whole province. I am inclined by my sense of duty, by the faith which I owe them, by my pity for them, by the example of all good Romans before me, by the custom of the Republic, by the old Constitution, to undertake this task, not as pertaining to my own interests, but to those of my close friends. That was his own reason for undertaking the case. Then he reminds the judges of what the Roman people wished, the people who had felt with dismay the injury inflicted upon them by Sulla's withdrawal of all power from the tribunes, and by the putting the whole authority of the bench into the hands of the senators. The Roman people, much as they have been made to suffer, regret nothing of that they have lost so much as the strength and majesty of the old judges. It is with the desire of having them back that they demand for the tribunes their former power. It is this misconduct of the present judges that has caused them to ask for another class of men for the judgment seat. By the fault, and to the shame of the judges of to-day, the censor's authority which has hitherto always been regarded as odious and stern, even that is now requested by the people. Then he goes on to show that, if justice is intended, this case will be put into the hands of him whom the Sicilians have themselves chosen. Had the Sicilians said that they were unwilling to trust their affairs to Caecilius because they had not known him, but were willing to trust him, Cicero, whom they did know, would not even that have been reasonable enough of itself? But the Sicilians had known both of them, had known Caecilius almost as well as Cicero, and had expressed themselves clearly. Much as they desired to have Cicero, they were as anxious not to have Caecilius. Even had they held their tongues about this, everybody would have known it, but they had been far from holding their tongues. Yet you offer yourself to these most unwilling clients, he says, turning to Caecilius. Yet you are ready to plead in a cause that does not belong to you. Yet you would defend those who would rather have no defender than such a one as you. Then he attacks Hortensius, the advocate for Verres. Let him not think that, if I am to be employed here, the judges can be bribed without infinite danger to all concerned. In undertaking this cause of the Sicilians, I undertake also the cause of the people of Rome at large. It is not only that one wretched sinner should be crushed, which is what the Sicilians want, but that this terrible injustice should be stopped altogether, in compliance with the wishes of the people. When we remember how this was spoken, in the presence of those very judges, in the presence of Hortensius himself, in reliance only on the public opinion which he was to create by his own words, we cannot but acknowledge that it is very fine. After that he again turns upon Caecilius. Learn from me, he says, how many things are expected from him who undertakes the accusation of another. If there be one of those qualities in you, I will give up to you all that you ask. Caecilius was probably even now in alliance with Verres. He himself, when Quaestor had robbed the people in the collection of the corn dues, and was unable, therefore, to include that matter in his accusation. You can bring no charge against him on this head, lest it be seen that you were a partner with him in the business. He ridicules him as to his personal insufficiency. What, Caecilius? As to those practices of the profession without which an action such as this cannot be carried on, do you think that there is nothing in them? Need there be no skill in the business, no habit of speaking, no familiarity with the forum, with the judgment seats, and the laws? 
I know well how difficult the ground is. Let me advise you to look into yourself, and to see whether you are able to do that kind of thing. Have you got voice for it? Prudence? Memory? Wit? Are you able to expose the life of Verres, as it must be done, to divide it into parts and make everything clear? In doing all this, though nature should have assisted you, as it has not at all, is of course implied, if from your earliest childhood you had been imbued with letters, if you had learned Greek at Athens instead of at Lilibaeum, Latin in Rome instead of in Sicily, still would it not be a task beyond your strength to undertake such a case, so widely thought of, to complete it by your industry, and then to grasp it in your memory, to make it plain by your eloquence, and to support it with voice and strength sufficient. Have I these gifts, you will ask? Would that I had. But from my childhood I have done all that I could to attain them. Cicero makes his point so well that I would fain go through the whole speech, were it not that a similar reason might induce me to give abridgments of all his speeches. It may not be that the readers of these orations will always sympathise with the orator in the matter which he has in hand, though his power over words is so great as to carry the reader with him very generally, even at this distance of time. But the neatness with which the weapon is used, the effectiveness of the thrust for the purpose intended, the certainty with which the nail is hit on the head, never with an expenditure of unnecessary force, but always with the exact strength wanted for the purpose. These are the characteristics of Cicero's speeches which carry the reader on with the delight which he will want to share with others, as a man when he has heard a good story instantly wishes to tell it again. And with Cicero we are charmed by the modernness, by the tone of to-day which his language takes the rapid way in which he runs from scorn to pity, from pity to anger, from anger to public zeal, and then instantly to irony and ridicule, implies a lightness of touch which, not unreasonably, surprises us as having endured for so many hundred years. That poetry should remain to us, even lines so vapid as some of those in which Ovid sang of love, seems to be more natural because verses, though they be light, must have been laboured. But these words spoken by Cicero seem almost to ring in our ears as having come to us direct from a man's lips. We see the anger gathering on the brow of Hortensius, followed by a look of acknowledged defeat. We see the startled attention of the judges, as they begin to feel that in this case they must depart from their intended purpose. We can understand how Caecilius cowered, and found consolation in being relieved from his task. We can fancy how Verres suffered, Verres whom no shame could have touched, when all his bribes were becoming inefficient under the hands of the orator. Cicero was chosen for the task, and then the real work began. The work as he did it was certainly beyond the strength of any ordinary advocate. It was necessary that he should proceed to Sicily, to obtain the evidence which was to be collected over the whole island. He must rate up, too, all the previous details of the life of this robber. He must be thoroughly prepared to meet the schemers on every point. He asked for a hundred and ten days for the purpose of getting up his case, but he took only fifty. We must imagine that, as he became more thoroughly versed in the intrigues of his adversaries, new lights came upon him. Were he to use the whole time allotted to him, or even half the time, and then make such an exposition of the criminal as he would delight to do were he to indulge himself with that perpetua oratio of which we hear, then the trial would be protracted till the coming of certain public games, during which the courts would not sit. There seem to have been three sets of games in his way, a special set for this year to be given by Pompey, which was to last fifteen days, then the Ludi Romani, which were continued for nine days. Soon after that would come the games in honour of victory, so soon that an adjournment over them would be obtained as a matter of course. In this way the trial would be thrown over into the next year, when Hortensius and one Metellus would be consuls, and another Metellus would be the praetor, controlling the judgment seats. Glabrio was praetor for this present year, 
In Glabrio Cicero could put some trust. With Hortensius and the two Metelluses in power, Veres would be as good as acquitted. Cicero, therefore, had to be on the alert, so that in this unexpected way, by sacrificing his own grand opportunity for a speech, he might conquer the schemers. We hear how he went to Sicily in a little boat from an unknown port, so as to escape the dangers contrived for him by the friends of Veres. If it could be arranged that the clever advocate should be kidnapped by a pirate, what a pleasant way would that be of putting an end to these abominable reforms! Let them get rid of Cicero, if only for a time, and the plunder might still be divided. Against all this he had to provide. When in Sicily he travelled sometimes on foot for the sake of caution, never with the retinue to which he was entitled as a Roman senator. As a Roman senator he might have demanded free entertainment at any town he entered, at great cost to the town. But from all this he abstained, and hurried back to Rome with his evidence so quickly that he was able to produce it before the judges, so as to save the adjournments which he feared. Veres retired from the trial, pleading guilty, after hearing the evidence. Of the witnesses, and of the manner in which they told the story, we have no account. The second speech which we have, the divinatio, or speech against Caecilius having been the first, is called the Actio Prima Contra Verem, the first process against Veres. This is almost entirely confined to an exhortation to the judges. Cicero had made up his mind to make no speech about Veres till after the trial should be over. There would not be the requisite time. The evidence he must bring forward, and he would so appall these corrupt judges that they should not dare to acquit the accused. This actio prima contains the words in which he did appall the judges. As we read them, we pity the judges. There were fourteen whose names we know, but that there may have been many more is probable. There was the praetor urbanus of the day, Glabrio. With him were Metellus, one of the praetors for the next year, and Caesonius, who with Cicero himself was aedile designate. There were three tribunes of the people, and two military tribunes. There was a Servilius, a Catulus, a Marcellus. Whom among these he suspected, we can hardly say. Certainly he suspected Metellus. To Servilius he paid an ornate compliment in one of the written orations published after the trial was over, from whence we may suppose that he was well inclined towards him. Of Glabrio he spoke well. The body, as a body, was of such a nature that he found it necessary to appall them. It is thus that he begins. Not by human wisdom, O ye judges, but by chance, and by the aid, as it were, of the gods themselves, an event has come to pass by which the hatred now felt for your order, and the infamy attached to the judgment-seat, may be appeased. For an opinion has gone abroad, disgraceful to the Republic, full of danger to yourselves, which is in the mouths of all men, not only here in Rome, but through all nations, that by these courts, as they are now constituted, a man, if he be only rich enough, will never be condemned, though he be ever so guilty. What an exordium with which to begin a forensic pleading before a bench of judges, composed of praetors, aediles, and coming consuls! And this at a time, too, when men's minds were still full of Sulla's power, when some were thinking that they too might be Sulla's, when the idea was still strong that a few nobles ought to rule the Roman Empire for their own advantage and their own luxury. What words to address a Metellus, a Catulus, and a Marcellus! I have brought before you such a wretch, he goes on to say, that by a just judgment upon him you can recover your favour with the people of Rome, and your credit with other nations. This is a trial in which you, indeed, will have to judge this man who is accused, but in which also the Roman people will have to judge you. By what is done to him will be determined whether a man who is guilty, and at the same time rich, can possibly be condemned in Rome. If the matter goes amiss here, all men will declare, not that better men should be selected out of your order, which would be impossible but that another order of citizens must be named from which to select the judges. 
This short speech was made. The witnesses were examined during nine days. Then Hortensius, with hardly a struggle at a reply, gave way, and Verres stood condemned by his own verdict. End of chapter 6, part 1